Hello, and welcome back to Church Online with the Denver Church of Christ. It is great to have you with us today, and I want to extend a very special welcome to those of you who may have just found us or are visiting with us for the very first time. Um, we're so glad that you could make it, and we really hope to get to meet you very soon in the near future. Now, this month, we have started a series entitled The Mission, and we're going to be studying that out for the entirety of the month. But today, we're going to take a brief hiatus from that subject matter because of a very special week we've just had. It has been election week, and it has been quite a doozy of a week. And I'm sure that there are many of us who are feeling the effects of just kind of the stress of a, of a potential change of leadership all over the place and what that means and how that might affect our lives. And so I want to spend a little bit today talking about that and our, and our need to trust, in, to trust in God. Before I get to that subject matter, I want to talk a little bit about something my kids do. Um, and that's the fact that, you know, my kids ask a lot of questions. And I'm, those of you who are parents, you understand this. There's just a lot of questions coming at you all the time. And it, it can be exhausting at times. And, and even sometimes it's clear that my kids don't even care about the answers that I give. They simply want to talk out loud for long periods of time without a break. So all of my kids have loved asking questions of favorites. Like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite song? Hey, Dad, who is your favorite Star Wars villain? What's your favorite number? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I hate these types of questions. And I have learned to answer these questions with something like this. Honestly, guys, your pops doesn't have a lot of favorite anything. My answers to these questions change from day to day, so it's impossible for me to boil down something like food or music or movies to one single thing. So I don't really have a lot of favorites. And yet this hasn't stopped them from asking these questions. I just think there's something so satisfying to them for me to give an answer that is singular, unchanging, and easy to understand. Dad, who is your favorite Marvel superhero? Well, today it's Star-Lord. Yesterday it was Wolverine. And who knows, tomorrow it might be Spider-Man. And most of you aren't comic book fans or nerds, but if you were, then you would know that each of these heroes have differences. And by saying that one of them is your favorite also says something about who you are. I'm gonna tell you something else about me right now. Something maybe slightly embarrassing. For whatever reasons, although I don't know a lot of this music, but for whatever reason, I have always liked Latin romantic songs. Canciones Romanticas. I don't like this type of music in almost any other context, but for whatever reason, I love this type of Latin music. Now, do I want someone forming a personal profile of me based on this fact? No. No, I don't. Because I would like anyone to also take into account Star-Lord and Spider-Man and Wolverine. I would want them to meet my five children, and certainly I would want them to see my beautiful wife. I want them to know how much I read and what books I read. I want them to understand my love of the outdoors and how much every day I long to go there. I want them, I don't want them taking one piece of information and categorizing the rest of me as a result of that singular piece of knowledge. I don't want anyone forming a complex profile on me based on one piece of information. Now, I'm sure that most of you feel exactly the same way about yourselves. So, I think it's important to remember during the elections that we need to be careful about making an entire profile of a person based upon their political leanings, especially given the fact of what humble place politics maintains in the realm of God's spiritual cosmos. Now, on the face of things, it might seem that what is happening today is that I'm attempting to minister to the effects of an election upon the emotional, spiritual, and mental state of believers. And there's truth to that, but it's also not quite right because I am sure that there are some people that may feel deeply connected to the candidates that participated in the elections this last week. But on the whole of it, I'm guessing that most people are more connected to the concepts that those candidates represented for them. And your candidate losing the election is a loss of a concept and an ideal such as truth or integrity or justice, change, compassion, or equity. What happens then? So how does it affect you, therefore, when you realize 
that there are other believers, your brothers and sisters, who have voted against your candidate and thereby also against the concept that you hold dear. Concepts that to you seem clear, straightforward, and obvious, as in you voted for X, and that clearly means that you are Y. And Y could equal any number of things, a capitulator, a misogynist, a bigot, indifferent to the truth, spiritually compromised, etc., etc., etc. Now, I say what I'm going to say today with an understanding of a fairly important fact to those who are listening. My life personally isn't really ever affected by something like a presidential election. Not in any material way, in any manner that I deem to be significant, at least not thus far. But that's not the truth for everybody else. Some people are deeply affected by the elections and feel that their lives are going to be deeply impacted by the results. So if you're someone that is deeply affected by the results of the elections and what happens afterwards, it can be pretty challenging to hear spiritual perspectives from people that are not affected. I think part of our challenge right now as a people is to create an appetite for listening to God during difficult moments. For many people, the admonishment to just trust God while they are in the midst of fear or anger can feel like a tactic to silence them. Or it can feel like a band-aid to stop the bleeding of what would be a mortal wound. Especially when those words are coming from someone you may not trust to fully understand where you are coming from. Now, years ago, I think most of you know this, my, my wife was diagnosed with cancer. And it was a pretty big scare for us. And there were weeks where we didn't really know how serious it was or if my wife was going to survive or, or, or anything. And the church was amazing during this time. Our neighborhood was amazing during this time. People came and brought us food and they tried to take care of our kids. And, you know, so we could go to doctor's appointments. And it, it was pretty inspiring to see how our, our friends and our, our spiritual family reacted to a time, a tough time that we were going through. Um, but we also got a lot of advice during that time. A lot of people were giving unsolicited input at points, but that which, which is fine. And I can remember one day someone came over and they were bringing us food, of course, and uh, after they dropped off the food, they pulled me aside and they kind of gave me some impassioned input about a path to healing for, for my wife. And they had talked about the, the idea that we should not trust, you know, big pharma, that, you know, forget chemotherapy and forget radiation, that those are things that are only going to hurt my wife in the end. And it's just a way to make money for, for major companies. That, that there was this other path, this un, untraditional path of healing that, that is even better. And they were really, you know, trying to get me to, to, to get on that path with them. And, you know, here's the thing. I totally believe that this person was, was well-meaning, okay? And I do, I believe that. Now, they, they weren't a doctor. They were just, they were just an average person. And, and do I think that this person would have been as passionate if it was their own spouse or parent or child that were sick like my wife? I don't know. They weren't really in my position at all. And, and there were a lot of people who were giving us input about things that weren't really in our position. But one of the things that my wife and I both believed very strongly is that regardless of whether or not input given to us was from people who understood what we were going through, we needed to stay rooted in the word of God. And it didn't matter who was giving us the word of God. We had to care about what the Bible said. And, and in the end, it doesn't matter how difficult things are we're all still called to follow what the Bible says, no matter what we're going through. And this is the difference to me. This is the quintessential difference between being an actual disciple of Jesus and just being a social or casual believer in God. And when I thought my wife might die from cancer, it was not easy to accept God's word, but that never changed the fact that I needed to. Now, I want to recount to you a moment, uh, a story and a difficult moment in Israel's history, okay? And, and it, was, it was a moment where God's people had to call upon their deepest trust in God at the risk of their own lives, the lives of their children, and the lives of their neighbor. And it's a story that takes place in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37. Now, it's a long story, so I'm just going to recount it to you. But I, I definitely recommend that during the week, you open up to Isaiah 36, 37, and just, just read the narrative for yourself. But it is the story of Jerusalem's defense against the Assyrians. 
Now, the Assyrian Empire was the largest empire of of that arena, of that of that part of the world, and it's one of the most impressive empires in world history. And they were sweeping across the Mediterranean and the Middle East and just bulldozing country after country. Now, one thing you have to understand about Israel is that Israel was Israel was a tiny little place. It was not a world player. It was not a major country. It did not have a great army. It was not well known. It was not renowned. So it was fully expected that Assyria would just go through Israel the way it had gone through everywhere else. All right. And so sure enough, one day, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, sends his greatest field commander to Jerusalem with 185,000 soldiers to take the city. He sh- and the field commander shows up, and the Israelites refuse to surrender. Now, one thing you have to understand about the brutality of the Assyrians is that they did not take uh, non-surrender kindly. As a matter of fact, if you did surrender, they would come in. They would probably kill your leaders, but the, everyone else would just get exiled to different parts of the world so that you couldn't coalesce into a single band ever again. But if you didn't surrender... They would tear down your city. They would kill most of the people. They would kill, they would torture you in front of your family. And it would be brutal. And, and they, may, they may kill everyone in the city as, as, a, as a reminder to all other places that, they should, that you should just surrender to the Assyrians. And so the, now this army is encamped outside of Jerusalem. And this, this field commander comes to the walls of Jerusalem and gives one of the greatest speeches in the Bible. It is just full of of psychological terror and it's 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 an ingenious speech meant to cause everyone to doubt the leadership of Jerusalem and to doubt and to doubt their god the, the the field commander comes up and says you know why are you not surrendering he goes listen i will give you 2000 chariots right now to fight us if you have enough people that know how to drive a chariot and he's just he is just insulting them over and over again. He goes, what basis do you have for not surrendering? Are you relying on your pal Egypt to come up and fight for you? Because we've already dealt with Egypt. And then he goes, you're not relying upon your God, are you? <clears throat> and he says, look at all of the countries. Look at all of the cities that we've destroyed. They all had gods. Which one of their gods saved them? What makes you guys so special? <clears throat> now, at this point, Israel's leaders they, they, they go to this field community and they go, hey, speak to us in your language because the, everybody else doesn't understand that. They don't need to hear all of this. Just speak to us in your language so we can have a conversation. And the field commander then says even louder, why would I do that? Why would I just talk to you in my language? Everybody here is going to die if you don't surrender. They're all going to eat their filth and drink their urine if you don't surrender. And he goes, no, let, let me get this straight. Your God is the God of the Bible. You know, and he's, he's kind of saying, He's, he's telling them who their God is. And he goes, no, what about Samaria, your brothers? Now, Samaria is just another name for the northern kingdom, the, the kingdom that had broke away from Judea. And he goes, they believe the same God you do. And we totally destroyed them. Your God did not save them. So why is your God going to save you? Don't trust in your leadership. Don't trust in your God. Or you're going to end up just the same as everybody else. And then he walks away. Now, what's kind of amazing here is that the people remained silent through this whole thing. Hezekiah had told them, don't respond to anything that this guy says. So the walls are just probably filled with people looking down on this field commander. This field commander gives this huge speech, and I'm sure he's used to giving this speech. And after he gives this speech, I'm sure he's used to seeing people crying and wailing and begging for mercy and criticizing the leadership. And, but the people remain absolutely silent. I'm sure it was somewhat eerie for the field commander. So Jerusalem's leaders go and report to King Hezekiah what the field commander said. Hezekiah prays to God. Sennacherib then sends a letter. The king of Assyria sends a personal letter to Hezekiah, kind of uh, insulting him, insulting God, and telling him we're about to destroy everything that you hold dear. So Hezekiah takes the letter, goes down to the temple, places it on the altar, and says, God, now is the time for you to save us. Everybody goes to sleep that night. They wake up in the morning and the Lord's angel has come and killed all 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers and the army has been decimated and they never come back to mess with Jerusalem again. So that, that's the biblical account. What's interesting is that historians have written of this uh, non-battle as well. 
One of my favorite books is a, is a book of essays written by historians giving their perspective of what would have happened if famous battles had gone the other way. And the, 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 the book begins with this battle. And uh, the, the author of this particular chapter is, is a man named William McNeely. He's a famous historian. And he is contending that this is, it, if this battle had been overturned, there would have been no other battle that would have been as, had as major effect as this battle if it, would, if it was overturned. And he writes, what if Sennacherib, king of Assyria, had conquered Jerusalem in 701 BC when he led his imperial army against the coalition of Egypt, Phoenicia, Philistine, and Jewish enemies and handily defeated them all? This, it seems to me, is the greatest might have been of all military history. This might be an odd thing to say about an engagement that never took place, yet Jerusalem's uh, preservation from attack by Sennacherib's army helped shape the subsequent history of the world far more profoundly than any other military action that I know of. He goes on to say, never before or since has so much depended on so few believing so wholly in their one true God and in such bold defiance of common sense. Now, you can imagine if you're in Jerusalem and you wake up the next morning and the army is gone, that God has defeated the army. You know how much that trust in him is going to resonate for the rest of your life, for your kid's life, for the, everyone is going to call upon this day for a very, very long time to help people trust in him when things go badly. This must have been such a great story, but you know, the genesis of this story starts elsewhere in the book of Isaiah, because the story begins with the prophet Isaiah trying to get people to trust God in the first place. He's telling the people of Jerusalem at the time something they didn't want to hear, something they weren't ready to accept, and something that they widely rejected. The task of calling people in moments of crisis to walk beside God and trust him is the story of almost every great victory in the Bible. And often in the days or years leading up to the victory that God has been planning, people struggle to listen to his words or trust in what he says. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1, this is where the story really begins. It says, Woe to the obstinate the children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look to help for Pharaoh's protection, for, for, from Pharaoh for protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zoan and their envoys have arrived in Haines, everyone will be put to shame because of the people useless to them, who bring neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace. Listen, at this point, the people are terrified of the Assyrians. The Assyrians have perfected forms of torture for those who resist them. So all of Jerusalem at this point, what they want is security. And Egypt is offering that to them. Egypt is telling them, if you pay tribute to us, we'll come and protect you from the Assyrians. We have great armies. And so the people are seeing Egypt as a potential solution to their problems. If we just get Egypt involved, they will save us from, from this doom that we're, that, that's impending upon us. They want to trust Egypt, but God is telling them, do not go to Egypt. Do not trust in any other human party. God wants them to just trust in him alone. But in their fear and in their frenzy, Israel is struggling with this. Now, I relate to this. I relate to, to the idea that I have to trust in, in these words, you know, that I got to trust a, a God that is invisible. And it's, it's easier to do that when things are good. But when things are stressful and hard, when, when I have something at risk, it becomes, it becomes very difficult to just trust in God. And so that is what Jerusalem is going through. They're seeing this empire coming against them. They don't even have an army. They, they, they don't have the weapons that they need. And the, and the solution from Isaiah is, don't worry about it. God is going to take care of you. The verse continues in verse 8. Go now, write it on a tablet for them. Inscribe it on a scroll that for the days to come it may be an everlasting witness. For these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. And again, what he's referring to there is that they keep wanting to put their trust in something outside of God. Instead of just trusting God, they want to put their trust in this other institution. They want to put this trust in Egypt to protect them. 
And God is saying, you're deceitful for doing this. You're lying by doing this. You cannot say that I trust God and still put most of your reliance in this, in this other place. It's a, it's, a, it's a lie. He goes on in verse 10. They see to their seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way, get off that path, and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Now, to me, when I read these verses, these verses represent the moment when someone, Isaiah in this case, comes in and tries to explain that we need to put our trust in God when we're the ones that are at risk, when we're the ones that are in danger. You know, trust God. Don't put your trust in third parties. Don't put your trust in world solutions. What you need to do and all you need to do is trust God. But that sort of reasoning doesn't really satisfy real fear and anger sometimes. So people sometimes say, stop making God the answer to everything. It doesn't work like that. Stop dismissing my fear and my pain by confronting me with God's words. Now, people probably don't say it quite like that, but the effect is usually exactly the same. If you attempt to assuage my feelings through the use of scripture, then you're dismissing the difficulty of my reality. Now, this puts us in a quandary. That type of reasoning puts us in a quandary. For who is allowed then to say something about anything to anyone else? What is the outcome of rejecting God's word as irrelevant? Because it's difficult to accept in a difficult moment. Well, God answers that when we continue reading. So go to Isaiah chapter 30. Now we're in verse 12. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message and relied on oppression and depended upon deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces, not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and in trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will also be swift. A thousand of you will flee at the threat of one. And at the threat of five, you all will flee till you are left like a flagstone, like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. So here you have God warning that those that persist along taking a path, the path of putting their trust elsewhere, are headed for heartbreak and a type of destruction. That by putting trust in parties outside God is the same as believing in a lie. And those lies that, that you believe in will end up hurting you. But God's not vindictive here. He's not really even angry. I think he seems to recognize the difficulty of the human position the Israelites are in, that it is a difficult predicament that the Israelites were facing. So God reminds of rest through repentance from this line of thinking. And if they don't repent, then their fear is going to make them irrational. They will see threats where, where there are none. They will flee where there is no need. But still, even after the warning being unheeded, God is ready to be compassionate and still provide them with justice. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 19 continues, People of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or whether you turn to the left, your, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Then you will desecrate your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, away with you. He will also send you rain for the seed you sow in the ground and the food that comes from the land will be rich and it will be plentiful. And that day your cattle will graze in broad meadows. The oxen and the donkey that work for the soil will eat fodder and mash. 
spread out with fork and shovel. In the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, streams of water will flow on every high mountain and every lofty hill. The moon will shine like the sun and the sunlight will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven full days when the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds he inflicts. You know, it really does become evident here how gracious God is to his people in their moments of hectic anxiety, even when good folks find it hard to heed God's word. We just have to make sure that we all maintain the same reservoir of grace for one another that God has for all of us when we struggle to trust him. That is the call of the hour, of the week, of the month, and of this unprecedented, sometimes horrible year. Be gracious to each other. We are all at different places right now in our willingness to put our full trust in God's ability to guide and protect our lives. And the words, put your trust in God, are way easier to say and way easier to hear when you don't feel threatened or afraid. And yet, they are no less true whether you are in paradise or whether you are in dire straits. It is this spirit of trusting our lives to God's hand in the very worst and most challenging moments that Jesus himself was calling upon God in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Luke 22, verse 41 through 44, it says, He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed even more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. I wonder if Jesus thought about Hezekiah when Hezekiah was in the temple, when Hezekiah brought the letter from king from the king of Assyria and laid it before God and said, you know, you do your thing here, God. We will trust you. Jesus trusted his life and the lives of everyone around him to God. Now, Jesus asked if there could be another way. Such was his own fear and stress. But in the end, Jesus adamantly refused to follow any way that was not God's will. So he entrusted himself to his father, all the way to his own execution. I know that whatever the results of the election end up being, many of you may struggle to accept the outcome. And many of you may feel that your lives are threatened by the outcome. Our example of Jesus shows us that trusting in God it's not simply something for times of peace. And trusting our lives, our energy, our focus, our passion, our families, our friends, our neighbors to God is most importantly a habit we practice during the hardest moments of our lives. As a matter of fact, the more risk there is in trusting God in a given moment, the greater the victory has been historically. As we take up our communion now, recommit your trust to God above all other forms of security in this life. Pray for your brothers and sisters who may be struggling with this week's outcomes, with this year's outcomes. And pray for our city and pray for our nation that we may soon find better times, where the moon shines like the day and the day is brighter than ever. Let's go ahead and pray for communion. Father, thank you so much for your words. Thank you so much for giving us so many opportunities to see how much trusting you works for those who believe in you. God, and I pray right now that you give us the courage and the strength to do what is good and to do what is right in each of our own consciences as we understand who you are and who Jesus is. God, as we take up the bread right now, we're reminded of the way that Jesus lived from day to day, putting his trust fully in you when he was threatened, when he was ridiculed, when, uh, when, when there was prejudice against him. Father, he trusted in you. And he did not put his trust in any other institution other than you. And God, as we take up the fruit of the vine, we remember the sacrifice that he made, the blood that he spilled, Father, um, that his trust of you went all the way to the point of his own execution where he sacrificed himself for us. God, he gave us reason, great reason to trust in you, that you gave up your son because you love us. Father, we can trust in you. Please help us to do so. Please help us to be bright lights in this world. Please help us to remember the example of your son as we go from day to day. It's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen.